Hey everybody, welcome to the program. I'm Rebecca McLaughlin Easton and this week we are celebrating the comedic and the visual arts. We speak to the most irreverent funny man to come out of Egypt. He is the MENA region's answer to Jon Stewart. I think Jon Stewart is already fed up by people calling me the Jon Stewart of Egypt. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry, it's not me. A little bit later on, we'll go behind the camera lens of video journalists who are telling tales of regional war, history and heroism through their work. But first, what do you get if you cross a heart surgeon with a political satirist? Well, according to Time magazine, you get one of the most influential people in the world. And we know him better in the region as Bassem Youssef. Egyptian funny man Bassem Youssef is best known for laughing at leaders and lambasting their politics, in particular in his homeland, where, inspired by the Egyptian revolution of 2011, he created satirical shows on his YouTube channel. Its almost instant following of millions led to Bassam's own show on Egypt's On TV, which shone a spotlight on the country's social and political situation, often directly criticizing the president and the Muslim Brotherhood. And this was not without its consequences for Bassam, who was accused of disturbing the peace and security of the country. He eventually relocated to the US to pursue his stand-up, digital and TV ambitions, making more than one appearance on The Daily Show in the wake of endless comparisons to its former host, Jon Stewart. The comedian was recently in the UAE as part of the stand-up entertainment at the inaugural GQ Awards, where Liverpool footballer Mohamed Salah from Egypt won Man of the Year. During his trip to the capital, Bassam stepped off the stage to talk to Inspire about spreading his political satire beyond the Arab world. Bassam, a very warm welcome to Inspire Middle East. Thank you so much for having me. When transferring your material from Arabic to English, is any of the potency lost, any of the, the nuance or the, the message itself, is that diluted in any way? You cannot translate humour. You can, you can explain the humour. But you have to be in a mindset where you have to perform for the people who speak the language. So when you perform, you're not doing the same jokes, you're not doing the same stories and just translate them. You have to repackage it. And that's just, it's, it's, it's only the beginning. Because again, if you get the words right, you have to adopt the same kind of delivery, the same kind of cadence, the same kind of pacing of the people who uh, do this language. You're a US resident now. Looking back at your career in Egypt and comparing it to modern day America, can any parallels be drawn, not least in how your material is received by leaders? The right or conservative wing in America or in Egypt is similar everywhere. Uh, the, the, the messaging, the way that they uh, reach their masses, the way that they use populism sometimes, uh, it's the same everywhere. A major difference, of course, is um, the margin of freedom where you're allowed to satirize or criticize uh, the system, the um, uh, authority, the administration, which is, of course, different. I think the biggest takeaway for me when I'm there in the United States is that I, I'm kind of more learning and receiving because uh, in Egypt, there was kind of a meteorotic rise for me and it was very fast, it's very quick. But uh, for in, the, in, in America, you have to stay at the kind of uh, take, um, you have to sit back and take your time. At the height of the attention by the authorities on you in Egypt when you were there, did you fear for your life? Uh, did you fear becoming a political prisoner? I had a deadline every week. I had a show that was uh, watched uh, by millions and I had to deliver and I had to do the best I can to do it. So I really didn't think about that. Uh, people from the outside were more concerned than I was. Is there any topic that's taboo for you? Is there anywhere that you won't go politically or anyone you won't criticise? Is anyone above that? Sometimes we will go and discuss something that could be too shocking for the masses, uh, that could turn people off. But again, this is, these are very, 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 very subjective issues. But in general, Nobody should be above satire, and nothing should be above satire. You've referenced your work as subjective. It's your opinion. You're not seeking to impose it on others. So given the current state of economic and political play in Egypt, what's your take on it? Where is Egypt headed? I, I think my opinion about what's happening in Egypt is quite clear. Uh, 
uh, there is a reason why I'm not there anymore. Uh, I, I think uh, it's not really sustainable to have uh, people worried about expressing their opinion openly. Uh, there is uh, a very high rise of populism. And uh, I think that will, uh, on the long term, you cannot just keep that, um, if you look at history, even modern history, uh, you, you, you cannot have a, a huge country with tens of millions of peoples uh, having to worry about expressing themselves just and using excuses like uh, um, nationalism or uh, the love of the country. This could black backlash and could backfire, and I don't think it's good and useful on the long run. You've admitted in the past that you suffer from imposter syndrome, that you somehow don't believe that you merit your current success, that you're not supposed to be here. Tell me, where does that stem from? You think that there's more other people that are more talented than you, and you wonder if you're ever going to do it. And I think it is also important to have this kind of feeling because it grounds you, it humbles you. You started out your career as a heart surgeon. Yeah. Are there any transferable skills that you've taken from one domain to the next? There's two things. There's uh, the work ethics, because when you do medicine, uh, it's just brutal. It's being a nerd, being very involved in the work that you do, uh, putting the hours. Uh, the repetition. The constant comparisons to John Stewart in the United States started pretty early on in your career. It was a piece of PR spin at the beginning, but it stuck. Is the relationship a genuine one? What do you think of John? I didn't start that rumor, but I worked for it. <laughs> so basically, uh, in the early days when I was still on YouTube, uh, there were, uh, when people were asking me, who's your inspiration? I was just like mentioning John Stewart in every single uh, sentence. Oh, I love him, I'm inspired by him. He established the art of television political satire. And I think that everybody, everybody right now, anybody right now who has, look at the late night show in, in the United States. They, they, they have been inspired uh, by him. Bassam, we have to wrap it up. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for speaking to me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Regardless of the subject matter, being in the right place at the right time is often how some of the best professional and amateur award-winning photographs came to be. Salim Saeed flicks through a photo album of some iconic images that not only made the news, they also made people think about the world in which they live. In less than a second, you can share someone's life story. Like this 2017 photo, showing the instant 13-year-old Thomas Abdullah Hamel realized he would live. The Yazidi boy was the only survivor of 23 kidnapped by ISIS, narrowly escaping after being used as a human shield. There to memorialize his life-changing moment was Iranian-born photojournalist Afshin Ismaili, who showcased his exhibition Children of War at the Exposure International Photography Festival in the UAE Emirate of Sharjah. Traveling mainly in Syria and Iraq since 2005, he risks his life to show the people behind the news headlines, like in the case of Hamo. Been brainwashed, trained to be a suicide bomber. He was kidnapped when he was 11. So that story in itself is a unique story. Without like photographing that image, that moment, and that boy at that place, so nobody knew about what happens to that people. Ismaili was born during war in Iran and says his camera became his salvation, and later on, an instrument in his life's mission to inform. My childhood was full of conflict, bombing. So I found out I have to, to do something. In recent decades, iconic examples of images with impact have included the Afghan girl, taken by American photographer Steve McCurry in 1984, who met a then 12-year-old Sharbat Gula at a refugee camp in Pakistan. Her piercing green eyes penetrated the hearts of people across the world, inspiring National Geographic to create a fund in her name and helped her family financially years later. And highlighting the Syrian refugee and European migrant crisis in 2015 was the tragic image of three-year-old Alan Kurdi's body washed ashore in Turkey. The disturbing photograph, no doubt, left a lasting imprint on the minds of millions. Recognizing the power a single picture can have to put important issues in focus, photography enthusiasts in the UAE are exploring ways to learn how to capture a snapshot of that memorable moment themselves and take their photography hobby to the next level. 
There are workshops teaching keen amateurs the moral responsibility their photos carry, and also the realities of what it means to turn a hobby into a profession. And you need to be very passionate about it to make this a business. You will have to endure periods of, of struggle and hustle and, and periods where you won't earn as much money as you um, probably would wish to. Laun says many photojournalists have sold pictures for less than a dollar while getting started in the business. But knowing that hasn't stopped UAE hobbyist Rashid al mazroui from considering taking it up as a career. After traveling to northern India's Ladakh region and greater Kashmir earlier this year, he says the simple life these neighbors of Tibet lived inspired him to consider doing this full time. Uh, photography is just a hobby for me. It's a passion right now. Uh, hopefully I turn this uh, passion to a profession. Maybe one day uh, I'll earn from doing photography and traveling all over the world and meeting different cultures and new people. After seeing snow for the very first time in India, El Mazrui is seeking more new experiences. He plans soon to travel to sub-Saharan Africa and use his camera to click with more people. Well, that is a wrap of our show for this week. Be sure to catch us again next time and do follow us on social media. Speaking of which, here are some Instagrammers that caught our attention this week. I'll see you next time. Jenny Lin from the Philippines saw the world through someone else's eyes upon a recent visit to Sharjah's Exposure Photography Exhibit. And check out funny man Basim Yusuf pulling funny faces with Mo Salah in the UAE capital.